The podcast you're about to listen to may contain random lines from musical theater, terrible attempts at original accents, and a sincere discussion about mental health. You have been warned. Are you ready to start singing with your feet? Formidable! Allez, c'est parti! Non, nous ne sommes pas fous, nous ne sommes pas ivres, nous sommes juste dans la joie. Une joie profonde, nos cœurs elles inondent. Cette joie, elle vient du ciel, non, nous ne sommes pas fous. Welcome to Sing With Your Feet. My name is Lily Field and I'm going to be your fairy godmother for the next half hour or so. For the last few months, we've been talking about our closets and mercifully, at least for some of you, this conversation is drawing to a close. For now, at least. The most important thing that we need to be aware of about our closets, or about any of our possessions for that matter, is that where our treasure is, our hearts will be too. So the more stuff we have, the less room we have in our hearts to truly enjoy the things that are there. So we started by recognizing that clothes, although they may look like clothes, are often not clothes at all. They are stand-ins for memories or dreams or goals. When those are good memories, or good dreams, and good goals, then life is good. But if those are bad memories, or unrealistic dreams, or failed goals, having them sit around in our closets can be like the psychological equivalent of a moth infestation. So we started working through our closets, identifying what we needed to get out of there, whether it is to free us from the constant reminders of parts of our lives that we would rather forget, and thereby complete the cycle of self-forgiveness and find healing in our hearts, or, well, simply because we know that we own too much stuff and that we never wear it and we want to make space in our hearts for other things. Then we talked about how to responsibly dispose of items that we didn't want anymore and how to care for the things that we do love with the promise that when we take care of our clothes, they will last for a long time. Then we talked about the clothes that we actually wear and what we like about them and methods for getting more wear out of the things we love. All of this because the truth is that stuff is already taking up space in our hearts. Something almost magical happens when we start to care for that stuff in a way that honors the space it's taking up in our hearts. It's a satisfaction that I like to call good stewardship, and it truly is its own reward. But what do we do when we find ourselves impulsively, if not compulsively, buying more things that we don't really even need or want? It almost feels like an addiction. And that's what we're talking about this week. I'm not a psychologist. I'm not an addiction specialist of any kind, so take everything I say in the spirit that is intended. I can't help you break the cycle of shopping addiction, but I can talk to you about what has been eye-opening to me as I've worked through my own endless desires for more. Last week, I talked about the film Confessions of a Shopaholic, and I confess to you that my shopping thing never put me in debt, and so I want to be very careful about how I project what I experienced onto others. Let's imagine, though, that there's a spectrum. On the far left is the people who have a perfectly healthy relationship with clothes and fashion in their closets. And on the far right are the people who have a real diagnosed addiction to shopping. This episode is directed to those of us who are quite a bit right of center on that spectrum. We are people who recognize that that's where we are. We recognize that we're feeling uncomfortable about where we are on that spectrum and we want to have a healthier relationship to our closet and to shopping. For most of my life, until the tail end of 2020, I experienced the ebb and flow of shopping addiction. For the unindoctrinated, what shopping addiction feels like is a sudden, urgent need for something new, or at the very least, something new to me. It's a thought that can come creeping in entirely on its own, unbidden, or it can come as a response to some kind of stimulus, say, seeing a pretty scarf in a shop window. The thought, whether it is accompanied with words or not, that follows that urge is 
my life would be better if I had X, Y, or Z. And then with very little encouragement, our brains start developing a plan to provide that better life for what our heart suddenly thinks it wants. As we've talked about for the last few weeks, the feeling of satisfaction once that something that we've pinned our hopes on, that thing that we think is going to improve our lives, once that feeling of satisfaction starts to wear off, our heart gets set on something else, and away we go for another ride on that treadmill. When my heart or the universe or God himself spoke to me in December of 2020, just in the wake of my postpartum depression having lifted, it was these words that I heard. You need to stop throwing money at your self-esteem problems. The kick in the butt I got was not that I needed to stop spending money willy-nilly. It was not that I needed to stop being wasteful or gluttonous about how much stuff I had in my closet. It was about my self-worth problems. That was why I started on this journey, to make peace with my closet. You will have your own reasons, but I really encourage you to deeply consider what is at the heart of your shopping cycles. At the heart of my shopping problem was the belief that I was uninteresting, unworthy, a failure, a terrible parent, unlovable, and unwanted. There was something about shopping that made those negative thoughts about myself hurt a little less. Maybe a new red purse would make me more interesting, or getting a great deal on something would make me interesting. Maybe buying something sustainable would make me worthy. Or sewing a button, a new button, onto a heavily discounted blouse would make me less of a failure. These were the reasons why I shopped. Were I to sit down with my closet inventory, I could probably name exactly what the negative thought about myself was that I was trying to numb by shopping for each item. When I talked a few months ago about the recursive shapes of our ideal life, that is the overarching themes that stretch across all of our ideal life categories, I mentioned that one of them for me was the word contentment. In every category of my ideal life, whether it is sexuality or parenting or spiritual life or a clean house, I know I want contentment. When I got to the point that I was able to acknowledge that one of the themes I desired for my life to resound with was contentment, and yet I was sabotaging this by continually seeking to numb my negative thoughts about myself by shopping, I knew that something had to give. So I had to start pursuing contentment even in my closet. Remember how I mentioned that I gave myself rules for my year of no shopping? One of those rules was that I was not to covet what other people had. Coveting, however weird and not of our era that word sounds, was drastically decreasing my experience of satisfaction and contentment. So I had to take action. Coveting, as it turns out, is not just about clothes. I'm sure this comes as no surprise to you. It can be about wanting another person's home, or their family life, or their career, or their opportunities, or, dare I say it, their spouse. Life is not always greener, right? That's what they say. But coveting is us believing that the grass will be greener on the other side. I don't like to project my hopes for my own life onto you, but I do think that contentment is one that bears consideration as a universally desirable pursuit. Learning how to be content in one area of your life when you really, really put your mind to it is a skill that you can then apply to all the other areas of your life when you get tripped up. It happens that my closet was the easiest one to confront. I'm going to sidestep for a moment the topic of shopping addiction because I want to talk about some objective factors that we can use to evaluate our closet. First, how long is something new? Is this a philosophical question? Because it sounds rather philosophical, doesn't it? I bet you have never questioned this in regards to your closet. I mean, how long is an item new? Before I started doing my closet inventory, I can genuinely say that I had no idea. I might have said, it's new the first time I wear it, or maybe it stops being new the first time I wash it. Part of the urge to shop comes from the thought, I have nothing to wear, which, as we have said numerous times in the past, is demonstrably false. What we mean is that I have nothing that fits, or 
I have nothing new, or I don't have enough time to make an informed decision about what I want to wear, or better yet, I have nothing I want to wear. But it is objectively false to say that I have nothing to wear. That one little thought, though, I have nothing to wear, is enough to open a little gateway for our heart to start wanting something new or new-ish. One way I have worked to counteract this is by establishing an objective rule. Until an item in my closet inventory is less than one euro per wear, I consider it new. Yes, this is a bit of a mind game that I play with myself, but shopping addiction is a mind game. Because I daily fill in my closet inventory with what I'm wearing that day, I am fairly aware of how much each item costs per wear. If I have a doubt, I can just check my spreadsheet. This is a choice. It is a choice to treat everything in my closet as though it was brand new until it reaches that coveted one euro per wear status. I'm not proud of it, but I used to be pretty lax about how I would care for my clothes. Leaving things on the floor and forgetting to hang them up and being lazy about how I would wash and dry them. I had to start paying attention to how I actually treated new clothes. How... When I would wash them for the first time, I would listen carefully for the wash cycle to complete so that I could avoid wrinkling, or how I hung them back up after wearing them if they didn't need washing right away, sometimes even buttoning up the buttons so it wouldn't wrinkle, airing them out for a day before putting them back in my closet, for example. And then I purposed to do those things for anything that was not at one euro per wear yet. Is this unnecessary work? I would argue that it is not. The longer I carefully respect the items in my closet, the longer they're going to last. Also, the more I treat them with respect, the more, does this sound insane? The more I actually like them. So yes, this is a mind game, but it is a mind game that actually leads to greater satisfaction. Another thing I can do objectively is to make it new again. Recently, I complained to you that my zebra high top sneakers had been worn out. And because I love to wear high top sneakers, I went back to wearing a pair of white Converse high top sneakers. Now, side note, what in the world was I doing owning white sneakers? It doesn't make any sense at all. But anywho, those white sneakers were beyond hope to ever be white again. They were filthy. I had washed them a few times in the past, but they were just kind of a funny grayish brownish color. So on a whim, I picked up a box of black dye. I used the washing machine method to dye my clothes, so I didn't want the dye to go to waste just with my shoes, so I threw in a pair of black jeans that have been worn approximately 250 times according to my closet inventory and needed a little pick-me-up. Now, these jeans, yes, they are old and they are they have a threadbare spot right there in the knee, which I knew I should have mended a long time ago, but heck, I thought to myself, they are less than a penny per wear, so who cares, right? The problem is that I hate shopping for jeans, and I really like these jeans. They're my old faithfuls, if you will. The shoes, which I have had for about three years, looked, when they came out of the dye bath, they looked brand spanking new. Although they had some wear on the soles, they looked absolutely impeccable. I had a pair of new shoelaces flying around from some project that I'd done, and I replaced the laces, and those shoes looked amazing. And the jeans, they also looked brand spanking new. And seeing them look so fresh and dark gave me the kick in the butt that I needed to mend the hole in the knee. Because I spent a few bucks on the dye... I decided that I would consider each of these items new again and redoubled my effort at taking care of them. Yet again, this is a mind game. Yes, maybe it is. But when you have something you love and you can make a teensy little investment that will shift your attitude about how you care for it, it can make a big difference. Investing your attention to being a good steward of what you own does something to the chemistry of your brain. It's almost as though the virtue of stewardship is its own reward. Elle 
partager et tout simplement de sourire et Now, I want to talk about something that I think is at the heart of shopping addiction. And I think that it can be demonstrated by what we experience when we start, for example, watching a really interesting show and suddenly have to binge all of the episodes of it as quickly as we can. We used to not be able to do that, remember? Remember Must See TV Thursdays? We had to wait a whole week to find out if Ross and Rachel would finally get together. And that almost painful feeling, that pang of disbelief when we would get to the end of an episode, well, that pang would pass. And rather quickly, too. The anticipation of the next week would quickly take its place. Now, with streaming platforms and social media, we have been trained to subsist on a steady diet of dopamine. That is the principle behind the endless scrolls and the little red notifications we receive on our devices. Dopamine is a feel-good chemical that we get when we feel noticed or have a good interaction. The little red numbers on our notifications hack our brain and teach us to seek out more of that feel-good chemical, just like when we watch a binge-worthy series. We find that we need more and more the next time to make us feel something. We aren't satisfied with what we had before, so we have to try harder to get the same dopamine hit. This is something that seems quite obvious when it comes to social media. If we've ever stepped away for even a day or two, it's incredible how our minds can reset. The need for the hit goes away pretty quickly. Shopping is just like this. And it is addictive in exactly the same way. We get a little hit of dopamine when we find something we like. We feel good. Once we possess the item and it comes into our everyday life, quite suddenly the pleasure goes away. This is the essence of the hedonic treadmill. That pleasure doesn't last very long. So to feel good again, we have to have something bigger or something nicer and thus develops the addiction. These aren't necessarily harmful addictions, now aren't they? For most of us, they don't keep us from paying our bills or living our lives. They're just little pleasures. But does anyone like to be manipulated by the chemicals in our bodies? Wouldn't life be simpler if we were not being led around by our impulses? Wouldn't it be nice if we could be satisfied with what we had instead of looking to what we don't yet have? On a side note, I gave up coffee for Lent, and let me tell you, Being manipulated by the chemicals in my body is something I am living. It's awful. So deciding not to be manipulated by the chemicals in our bodies is a decision that each one of us has to reach individually. Remember a long time ago when we talked about giving consent to the life that we currently have? With consent comes a decision to be satisfied, to stop wanting what we don't or we can't have. It is not impossible to be satisfied, but it takes making firm decisions and sticking to them and learning our triggers and being able to struggle through the pain. It is a process by which we learn to love what we already own and to be grateful for it. So this brings us full circle about how we started this episode, talking about how shopping is like an addiction. And like any addiction, it isn't enough to just go cold turkey. We have to study our triggers and our reasons for wanting to stop, to make a plan to reduce our exposure to temptation, and to have people around us who will help us succeed. A few weeks ago, my husband showed me just how much he loves me. Not to brag or anything, but my husband took our scalawags to his parents for five, five days, leaving me home alone. This is genuinely one of my favorite moments of the year. I love my kids, love my husband, but wow, those huge swaths of time completely alone are so, so important to me. I can't exactly put into words why I had some trepidation about this particular week, but at the start of the break, I didn't feel ready for the break. I think what I was most afraid of was that I would find a way to waste this gift, that I would end up frittering away my time on TikTok or Twitter and watching clips of Parks and Recreation on YouTube. I was also afraid that I would set unrealistic goals like I sometimes do, and then I would push myself through the night to meet those goals, thereby negating any hope of getting some much-needed rest. 
examining why I was genuinely feeling apprehension about this free time I was that I was going to have, that was super important. There were two risks, getting absolutely nothing done because I didn't have a plan, or having so much of a plan that I didn't get to rest. So I developed a strategy. The very first day, I sat down with my notebook and I wrote down what I thought I might realistically be able to accomplish during my five-day staycation. And then I purposed to not consult that list again until the last day of my break. My reasoning was that if it was really important and memorable enough, I would do it. And if it wasn't, then I wouldn't blame myself. But at least I had set some goals, and the very fact of having done that would keep me out of the abyss of endless video clips. There was somewhere I had to be that first morning, and all the way home, I made a plan. I intended to take some notes on a few podcast episodes that I wanted to write, and then do a little bit of research. And then, when it got dark, I was going to go to bed early and knit while watching a double feature of Confessions of a Shopaholic and In Her Shoes. Except that, that afternoon, instead of sitting down to work on the computer to organize my thoughts, I used a stack of abandoned drawings that my children had done to take my notes. I didn't look at my watch once. As a matter of fact, I think I took it off at one point, and I never even thought to put it back on. And because I had turned the ringer off on my phone while I was out in the morning, and I was likewise deep in my thoughts when I got home, I not once took out my phone to check it all day. I was in flow. When I finally realized that the sun had gone down and I finally got up to turn on a light, I estimated that I must have been working for six hours without even getting up to go to the bathroom. And that's not even the amazing part. The amazing part was, as I went around the living room, turning on lights and adjusting the throw pillows on the couch, I felt so rested, relaxed, content, satisfied. I hadn't touched an electronic device for half a day, and my soul could tell. I felt like I had set a reset button. Now, keep in mind, I am a Twitter devotee and a TikTok junkie, so I am not someone who says this lightly. Stepping away from my devices and getting into the flow, that creative state in which our energy and available time and skills are at maximum capacity, was better than any nap or any spa day at restoring my energy. I had accidentally gone off the grid for six hours and it revitalized my life. So I want to use this going off the grid thing as a metaphor for a shopping hiatus. When you decide to stop shopping, aka going off the grid, and you provide yourself the context and opportunity and reasons to step away from it, you're giving yourself a chance to tune in to the little discomforts that push you to seek the next dip dopamine hit of something new and to turn your attention to what you already own and hopefully find deep abiding contentment with it. I want you to believe me on something. For however long you decide to stop shopping, there will be a reset in your soul. Setting goals for your shopping hiatus is important. I mean, saving money is a great one, but so is getting to the heart of your impulse shopping. What I would recommend, if you're feeling like maybe you want to try a shopping hiatus and to get a reset on your buying habits, is to set some goals for it. Set those goals. Get the timer started a month, six months, a year, whatever. And then don't look at your list of goals until your time is up. What you think is important to pursue might end up being the most important thing. But leaving space to be surprised by what you might find out is such an underrated part of accomplishing goals. On the other hand, make a plan and set some rules based on what you know today about what your triggers are, about your temptations and your skills. For example, one of my rules for my shopping hiatus was to study up on how to alter clothes and mend socks. There was a practical reason for this. I get holes in my socks and I had a bin full of clothes with potential that I wanted to make wearable again. You know how you can find some joy in this process. You know you. You know what motivates you. So seek ways to draw joy into your challenge. During my year-long shopping hiatus, I set myself motivational rewards that had nothing to do with clothes. Remember, celebrating our progress is crucial to motivation. So I imagined the one thing that I had always wanted to do, which was, and this might make you laugh, but that one thing that I always wanted to do was have... Well, I always wanted to have my own radio show, but in this case, I wanted to have a podcast. 
I knew that getting the podcast out into the world would take some work, and my idea was to divide up my rewards quarter by quarter as I survived my year of no shopping. On March 31st, I... I ordered myself the book, Everybody Has a Podcast Except You by the McElroy Brothers. As I no-shopped my way through the next three months, I read my book, annotating it, and taking notes. And at the end of six months, I bought my first microphone, a Yeti Blue. Incidentally, probably with about the amount of money that I saved by not shopping for the first three months or three, six months of the year. And then I started messing around with demos of my podcast. By the time September rolled around, I asked my friends at Seven Production here in Mulhouse, France, to help me learn to edit the podcast. Eric Muller, who is a filmmaker and a saint, gave me an intensive one-day training on the editing software that I would need to use to make my podcast happen. And my friend Jonathan Moulin, he gave me the use of the music that we enjoy at the intro and outro of the podcast. January 6th, 2022, just after my one year of no shopping was up, I dropped my first episode. This all was an incredible motivation for me to keep up with my challenge. Or, for example, I had set a rule for that year that I had to wear absolutely everything in my closet or else it had to be given away, and I had several gorgeous evening gowns with no excuse to wear them. So, Come October, I begged some musician friends to start planning a series of living room Christmas concerts around town to which I could wear my evening gowns. It sounds like a lot of trouble to go through to just get through a New Year's resolution of buying no clothes, but music and performing motivate me. Plus, it gave me an opportunity to spend time with my friends. This was a great way to get those dresses worn. Like I said, you know what motivates you. Be crazy. Get other people involved if you need to. And if you need help thinking this through, I would be so happy to help you come up with ideas. So here we are at the part of the podcast in which I update you on my progress towards living out the golden rule this year in my everyday life. I had to set up a few rules for myself about this too, and maybe at some point I will go into detail about what those rules were. But just for now, one of my rules that that I had set for myself was that if something someone asked me to do would take less than a minute, then I needed to do it right away, no delay. Now this sounds easy enough, but as you probably would have imagined, but not me, it felt like I was getting interrupted a lot to do plenty of disparate things. However, what I did discover after a while was that very often we underestimate how long things are gonna take. We think that it's just going to take a minute and that it ends up being this five minute long ordeal, by the end of which we have forgotten what we were doing in the first place. Well, my youngest scalawag has a favorite little stuffed animal named Gerald the giraffe. Gerald has a few torn seams, and my youngest has been asking me to mend Gerald for weeks. And I am not proud of this, but I think it might have even been months that he's been asking me to fix Gerald. I knew for a fact that mending Gerald would require more than a minute, so I kept putting it off. And I would always forget that he had asked me when I finally did have the time and had the materials available to do it. But this last week, it was early in the morning, and he reminded me that Gerald still had a hole. So I did the whole ambulance squeal thing, woo, woo, and said, I'm taking him to the hospital right now. Because I realized for sure that if I were asking something of someone that they weren't capable of doing, and that person just kept on forgetting about it, well, I would probably start to feel unloved. So I took Gerald. It happened that I had been mending something the night before, so everything was right there on my nightstand. Needle, thread, scissors. The actual mending of Gerald, it literally took about a minute. And it made my littlest one so happy, and I felt horrible for having put it off for so long. What I think happened here is that it it was the reverse of how I often underestimate how long something will take. This time, because the project required supplies, I assumed it would take longer than it actually did. So I think the golden rule lesson in this is that maybe when someone asks me to do something and I'm not sure that I will have the time to complete the whole project, I need to set a timer for a minute and start assembling the materials to get the project done and then put them in a prominent place so that when I have a few minutes, I can do it and not forget about it. It's a thought, and it's a thought that I am going to put into action this week and see how it helps me do better for others. 
Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode. We are finally at the end of our series about our wardrobes. It's been a fun ride, and I hope you walked away with something that will help you make more space in your heart for what really matters. Next week, we're moving on to a new topic, one that I hope you will find thought-provoking. I'm looking forward to diving into a new subject with you. I want to say thank you to my friends at Seven Productions here in Mulhouse, France for the use of the song La Joie as the intro and outro to the show, as well as to Matt Kugler who sang it. And Matt's new album is called Aventura. It's out on all the digital music platforms and it's amazing. Also, I want to say thank you to Claude Equay who wrote that amazing song. This is your fairy godmother signing off. Just remember, it's never too late to start singing with your feet. <laughs>